Mark, it's a real ple uh, pleasure to have you with us for uh, UNFFI's Global Roundtable. Um, you know, two years ago at our last uh, Global Roundtable, we spoke uh, together about your plans to establish a GFANS. And then, you know, since then, uh, wow, you know, what a follow through and uh, UNFFI has been really pleased to support your leadership in getting the banking and investment insurance industries onto the net zero trajectories. Um, so if we can get started and dive right in, um, GFANS, uh, under GFANS, UNFFI is convening the net zero banking insurance and the asset owner alliances. And each one of these alliances, they have their own commitment, their own means of implementation and their own accountability mechanisms. But you know, of course, um, we need to align the different parts of the financial system if we're going to succeed. And of course, that's the difficult, challenging remit of GFANS. So, could could you um, could you tell us how do you see GFANS pulling together the alliances and making them fit for purpose to the overall objective that we're all uh, aiming for? Great. Um, and well, first off, um, thanks for having me, Eric, uh, virtually, um, uh, next in person. Um, uh, and secondly, uh, let me really commend uh, your work, uh, your personal work and the work of UNIP FI um, in these key sector alliances and by extension uh, at the core of GFANS. Um, and of course, uh, in so many other ways over the years uh, and really have given us a shot uh, to have a financial system that's fit for purpose uh, for the transition and for many uh, other aspects of uh, sustainability, um, financial stability, um, uh, growth and prosperity. Now, um, I think the first thing to say, is, and, and your question, you know, the premise of the question captures it, which is, yes, there's tremendous diversity in the financial sector. We need all of the financial sector uh, taking climate change into account, um, but uh, elements need to be tailored uh, and other elements need to be um, uh, made consistent across the alliances um, as much as possible. I mean, obviously, these are voluntary uh, agreements. Um, let me start in terms of the overall approach uh, that we have. And um, it, it does start with commitments. Um, you know, we talk, um, you know, it was even less than two years ago, I guess, when we last uh, uh, had the discussion. It was it was the concept that we were thinking about with uh, bringing uh, the alliances together, uh, and it was to uh, have common commitments uh, for fair share of uh, financed emissions uh, uh, consistent with the one and a half degree path. Um, and it starts with those commitments. It starts with building up uh, accountability under that, and I'll come back to it. Um, really, what we've been doing, and this goes to the heart of your question, um, since then has been operationalizing those commitments, if you will. Um, and at the heart of that has been developing the core frameworks uh, for the approach. And I'll, I'll say a few words more on that in a second. Um, and then, of course, the purpose of all of this is action uh, in the real economy and financing that action in the real economy. Uh, another component, though, another core building block of all this is accountability and the transparency that's necessary for that. Um, and as you know, and you're helping to support this, the uh, development of this net zero data public utility will be essential for that accountability and for creating through that accountability and transparency uh, a feedback loop, which should be a positive feedback loop um, to financial institutions, to companies and to governments about what else needs to be done if the world's going to move uh, to where people want. Um, so that is somewhat bigger picture. Um, the specifics of how we're looking to uh, establish common frameworks, common but differentiated, I guess is probably the right way to, uh, to say it, uh, but common frameworks across uh, the various alliances and therefore across uh, the financial sector is uh, at its heart is to develop a common framework for the net zero transition plans of the financial institutions themselves. Uh, as you know, and you've been at the heart of this, there's been a huge effort uh, to develop uh, quite detailed uh, guidance for this. And it is only guidance. Uh, these aren't requirements, but they're guidance for the uh, individual institutions. Uh, it's gone out to consultation. There's been over a thousand responses over the course of the northern summer. Um, we're working on finalizing that for COP27. And I think that's a core, core building block. Um, as well, we need guidance for and have guidance for the use of decarbonization pathways for different sectors. So whether it's the steel sector or the oil and gas sector, we're not creating new pathways, but it's how to use those most effectively. 
that segues into the third element or the third pillar of the guidance, which is around uh, the use of uh, forward-looking portfolio alignment me metrics. One of the key themes in climate and indeed in finance is the need to look forward uh, and look to impact. Um, and in addition, uh, really developing something new, uh, but something that was absolutely necessary uh, for the transition is a framework for the transparent and responsible phasing out of high emission uh, uh, assets or stranded assets, ultimately stranded assets, so the managed transition of that. And as I say, all of that wrapped within, or not wrapped in, but feeding into uh, a public accountability mechanism, which is being built from scratch. Um, and has the benefit of all the major private data providers, so Refinitiv, London Stock Exchange, um, MSCI, S&P, uh, now I'm going to get in trouble because I won't name everyone, Bloomberg, uh, feeding in Morningstar, um, and then as well um, having uh, the public authorities there, uh, so the, uh, the UN, of course, uh, but the OECD, the IMF, um, uh, as supported by the French presidency, the European Commission, a number of other governments, uh, the NGFS and others. So look, that's the that's the process. And I would say, if I'm allowed to make a final comment just on a, an observation, um, I'm very pleased with the way that um, the various types of financial institutions uh, have worked together to find common ground, common approaches, while still respecting the differences that they naturally have. And I think this puts us in, in a very good position to turn commitments into action. Of course, some of that's happening already, but really to see an acceleration of that um, going forward. Great, well, well thank you, uh, Mark. If we can try to dig into some of the, the topics you, you've, um, you, you've laid out. And I think, you know, one is that um, when GFANS launched, um, uh, uh, you know, we've had um, 450 financial institutions for members, and I know it's it's uh, it's grown far beyond that today. Um, GFANS and the, and the alliances were convening their voluntary frameworks, and uh, we don't have the whole industry in the tent yeah. yet. Um, and so, I guess the question is, how do we move from voluntary frameworks and sort of these coalitions of the willing um, to mainstream adoption? And I, obviously, yeah. as part of that. What's the policy piece? Well, I think the first thing, it, well, there's a, so there's a policy piece in terms of, and I'll come to that in terms of the role of the, the authorities, whether in some jurisdictions it's, um, uh, it's, it's in law and others, it's supervisory expectations or uh, regulatory standards. And I'll come to that. But the, I think the first thing um, in your question, which is an important element, which is how do we grow and, and have the coverage and how do you have a, a positive um, feedback loop that uh, is having an effect. And you know this from experience, from your experience with the alliances. So if the Net Zero Asset Owners Alliance uh, has not had not been as successful as it had been, uh, and obviously UNFFI at the core of that, it you know really created the possibility and the example for other alliances in asset management uh, in banking. I mean, we we did not have a banking alliance that, uh, until uh, it, it actually was launched in line with uh, GFANS and, of course, with your help. So it's the success first and foremost of those alliances which give the building blocks to move forward, first point. Second, related to that, I think part of how we develop it, and, and I'm going to stretch to an analog with the TCFD, where you had leading financial institutions and leading companies develop the TCFD and implement it and demonstrate its usefulness and also demonstrate where it doesn't work and where there were holes and things needed to be adjusted. So it's by putting it into practice of leading financial institutions that we really start to get traction. And that's what we're going to see. And of course, we have an advantage, whereas with the TCFD, you know, it was measured um, in, um, you know, a few hundred institutions about 10 trillion of market cap and you know we're in the 130 plus trillion as you know of balance sheet so the impact is much greater um so i think it's 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 um in the practice with the success with the best practitioners that we get the foundation for that to move forward and we have the impact directly in the in the financial system and we make capital available key thing to the companies that are actually doing the work decarbonizing but that's not enough because it still leaves gap. And I think the lesson that certainly I take, and I think you take, and others, uh, many others take from TCFD is 
fallen tree can go so far and it, and it's good to have the leaders in the private sector to get on with issues and fill gaps but ultimately to have universal coverage to have consistency credibility um uh you uh, you really do need to move to mandatory uh, requirements be a little careful not to move too soon because you want to get some of the kinks out and have some of the uh, some of the learnings from actual application, uh, but you don't want to leave it too long either. And you know, one of the things we know is we don't have a lot of time with climate. So the I think the space between moving from the voluntary approach around transition planning to mandatory is much shorter. In fact, and fine, this is my sort of final point in answer to your question, which is as you know, we're working closely with those initiatives that are live that um, are in the European Union um, uh, with, uh, with FRAG and others uh, in, the, in the UK with uh, the Transition Pathways uh, Initiative uh, and in other jurisdictions, uh, the Monetary Authority of Singapore, the NGFS with supervisory expectations, et cetera, working directly with them to help map what's being done across the alliances and GFANs into, as, to provide the basis for the decisions that authorities are taking really in real time about uh, converting this into mandatory. So what um, I think, you know, what you're starting to map out is a wider narrative and, and part of what unit defy we talk about is kind of what's the rationale for financial institutions to voluntarily lean in to addressing these issues rather than just sitting back and waiting to be you know, regulated into it. And I think as you described, there definitely is an interest like you saw with TCFD to get started and, and you know, whether regulators are gonna step in or not eventually, a lot of it will depend on voluntary action and regulators will learn from that voluntary action. And I think, as you said, you know, it's even more complicated now with net zero from a regulatory perspective. So the need for, for yeah. voluntary leadership is, is critical. And that's essentially what we're seeing. Of course, then there is the need for the follow-up. And as you say, one of the challenges is the time scale that uh, we need to pull the parts together very quickly. And regulators are gonna have to figure out how to come up with things that create like for like um, transition planning requirements, expectations, et cetera. So it really, I think that the job is cut out for, for both sides. And, and let me, Mark, if I could come into, um, you know, one of the you know, big issues is, you know, you've said in the past, um, you know, we, we need to figure out how to transition the entire economy. Um, and as you know, and that's every sector essentially. And so I guess the question is, you know, what happens if we, parts of the real economy remain unresponsive? What are the tools in the toolkit and how should the financial actors be seeing what is their responsibility to you know, improve the responsiveness or what are the options they have? Yeah, it's um, so the first thing, let me let me actually just if I can reemphasize the point you just made, Eric, and then I'll answer the question, which is that, you know, the advantage of voluntary action, such as we've seen through the alliances and through the alliances at GFANS is that um, Financial institutions are looking for decision useful information. Um, you know, they don't want to, they're not looking to boil the ocean in terms of information. It's what, what do they need in terms of climate disclosure uh, to manage risk? What do they need in terms of from those real economy companies, their, their clients, their investments, their portfolio companies, in terms of determining who is aligned or aligning a uh, key word aligning with the transition path to net zero and who should they get behind in terms of lending or investing in order to help them do that and who's not. Um, and if, and your question goes to that element of who's not um, and who doesn't have a plan, for example, um, and, or, you know, effectively isn't, uh, has decided to opt out of the transition uh, for whatever reason. Um, and you know the first approach um, that that we're encouraging for financial institutions is to engage with their portfolio companies and uh, to seek to work with them to find ways for those companies to get on or start to converge towards the path um, uh, consistent with one and a half degrees. Now, if the company cannot or the asset is not suited to that, then it becomes a question of, well, financing a wind down effectively or a managed phase out of that asset. Um, so we're trying to, uh, uh, well, uh, 
the core thesis or the core objective rather is to ensure real world decarbonization, not just portfolio decarbonization. So as much as possible, we want to avoid a situation where uh, the financial uh, sector is divesting of problems or challenges, rather it's engaging with those challenges and helping them to be solved. There will be cases, of course, um, it always happens in when there's change in the economy, there will be cases where activities need to be wind down, wound down. It's better for the system if that's done in a transparent and responsible way, uh, rather than pushed into the shadows. And, and, and so the framework uh, that, that we've been developing uh, helps with that, as does the, the transparency through the, through the data utility. Yeah, and I think uh, you know this point about the shadows. Um, certainly, I think a lot of work needs to be done to figure out how do we shine a light and get more clarity so that um, you know economic activities they need to transition that they don't find shadow places to go and still get access to capital. And uh, yeah, and I think if I may, Eric, it's it's interesting. You know, as the system comes together, and particularly as there's public reporting um, and the data is there, if you're not in that system, you're in the shadow by you're in the shadows by definition, right? Um, and um, you know, we'll let stakeholders form their own judgments about um, who's doing you know the right thing or who's acting consistent with the objectives of uh, of, of the you know 100 and, uh, 190 uh, signatories of uh, the Glasgow Climate Pact. Absolutely. Yeah. Great. Okay, so let's move to um, uh, the topic of. Um, transitioning and I guess the question of your views on financing that transition and also of course you know the issues of um, public private blending and stuff like that where are we at with that today well I um, it's a huge issue um, because uh, you know we need and you know this but just to re-emphasize it um, the, the world needs to find an extra trillion dollars sort of by the end of this uh, decade uh, for financing the transition in the emerging and developing world. And that's, by the way, that's before um, spending or doesn't include rather spending on adaptation and resilience, which, which will also be uh, considerable. Um, and we don't have all the instruments at the moment in order to do that. Um, so what we've been working on is to try to catalyze through real world financing packages uh, for some of the major emerging economies um, to accelerate their energy transition. And in the process of doing that, uh, develop um, the blended finance instruments, uh, instruments, uh, other instruments that could be based off of carbon, uh, carbon credit markets, carbon offset markets uh, that could help um, uh, fill out the financing package, as well as uh, for some of these economies, uh, there's a real possibility of pure play, if you will, private sector financing. So we're looking to bring all of that together um, under these just energy transition partnerships. Um, the big negotiations or discussions with those uh, are undertaking for uh, countries like Indonesia, uh, Vietnam, South Africa as three prominent examples, Senegal is another. Uh, and it's, you know, it's a complicated process. It hasn't been done before. Um, secondly, um, it involves a lot of stakeholders, first and foremost, the countries themselves, it's their plan, it's their strategy that's being financed, um, but as well, concessional capital from major, um, some major economies, so principally in the G7, the MDBs as well, and there's lots of MDBs and lots of policies and, you know, a track record on blended finance, which is modest, to be candid, uh, in terms of the scale of catalyzing. And then, of course, in terms of carbon offset markets or carbon credit markets, high integrity carbon credit markets are, are people have been working on getting the standards to develop those now it's the test of whether they can actually uh, fly and actually develop we think they can be uh, but it takes a lot of work so to, to bring it together um, what we've what we've been doing apart from calling for this is actually getting um, into these uh, discussions uh, particularly with Indonesia and, and Vietnam and, and South Africa with specific members of GFANS, a number of institutions that are working alongside the governments to help uh, develop these uh, financing plans and packages. It's hugely important, last point, uh, 
because for the countries involved, it's material for them. It's also their big economy. So it's going to be material for the global climate if it works, but also because it will create financing vehicles, templates that could be replicated if we do it right. Um, now, there's much, much more that needs to be done uh, in terms of uh, uh, the, 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 the next tier of emitters, if I can put it that way. I mean, all countries are equally important, but in terms of emissions, there's some that are much bigger than others. Um, and, the, and, and the financing vehicles and mechanisms will, will, will need to be adjusted accordingly. Absolutely. And I think, you know, one of the issues we see from the, um, the large um, asset owners um, and managers is you know, a, a lot around geography. You know, the challenges is, is the way they are regulated. It's quite hard for them to put capital into some of the markets that need it most. And so I guess it begs the question in terms of the role of, of the multilateral, the development banks and the development bank community, do we have the products and the tools today that will allow capital to move across borders in a way that's needed at the scales that are required? I, 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 the, the short answer is we don't. Um, uh, we, you know, we don't have them at scale. Um, and, uh, and what hasn't been taken yet, and there's some glimmers of possibility here, for example, with the IMF's resilience uh, uh, trust uh, that's that's building off of the SDRs as a potential template. I don't want to oversell it because it's still early days, but that at least that's the intention. A potential approach that does what the multilateral development banks really should be doing and the international financial institutions should be doing, which is taking a broader portfolio approach to risk, which really only they can, um, and the types of political and macroeconomic risks that are, of course, spread across all these countries, and internalizing some of those, and in, in the process of doing that, internalizing some of the externalities around carbon and the climate, in a way that, uh, and, and I'll go back to, as you say, the members of the uh, Net Zero Asset Owners Alliance, in a way that opens up the possibility to put money, significant sums of money uh, to be invested, put it to work in the type of infrastructure that's needed for the energy transition and for more uh, resilient economies. There is a possibility to break this open, but it does require um, uh, some in, uh, you know, considerable innovation from the international financial institutions. And we really do need to shine a light on that uh, and figure out whether we're going to do that. And if we're not gonna do that because of the articles of association or some reason at these IFIs, then, uh, then it should go directly to the major shareholders to determine how to change that in order to get it done. Because I, it's not clear to me that we will unlock, uh, how we're gonna unlock the scale of capital that's necessary without doing that without them playing that role, right? Right, so I think um, basically what you're saying is there is obviously a question around, to some extent, political will, that there are some some you know difficult questions that need to be taken in, obviously, many actors and in many venues, and, including, I think, as you say, of how can we get, um, if we're gonna do things at scale, and it's gonna require both public and private capital, risk sharing, et cetera, um, we need to be really uh, big picture and in understanding institutions, institutional setups, and whether or not um, some some uh, strengthening needs to be made in, in different areas. Yeah, so, and I, so, if I can make just one other point for the participants in this roundtable is that um, look, the the this is part of the advantage of having the alliances and having G fans and having this focus on um, net zero. So these institutions are looking for opportunities to put money to work that is consistent with the transition. In fact, they will be judged increasingly over time by what proportion of their assets are aligned with the transition. Uh, and so that means there's pool of capital available, but it's available for opportunities that are consistent with the transition. And so the challenge that goes to, I guess, the recipient countries, but very much the IFIs and the MDBs is, well, what are you doing to translate that pool onto the ground for the opportunity? And it, and it can't be the old playbook because it just doesn't scale at the, uh, to, the, to the degree that uh, we need. Right, absolutely. And we're, we're, obviously this is about stretch ambition, it's about stretch implementation. And, yeah. and we have the setups required. So let's come back and just in terms of, of closing out, uh, Mark, um, uh, could you, I mean, we know that in terms of the targets, uh, 2050 is the easy part. Interim targets are the more important part. Uh, the Asset Owner Alliance, they've already issued their targets for 2025. Now, they got started earlier than the others. Uh, 
the banking alliance and most of the other G Finance alliances, I believe, are focused on 2030. Now, we can't wait till 2030 to see if they're, they're being successful. Uh, you know, roughly uh, the, the objective is to align with the science, which means reduction, you know, 45, 50% by 2030, very significant uh, uh, mitigation expectations. But what, from a GFANS perspective, could you set some expectations for the alliances, let's say two to three years out, they've shifted from making commitments to now implementation. Yeah. So what would you expect of them two to three years from now? What should they have done which would give you comfortable that we're, we're on the way to what needs to get done by 2030 and, and onwards. Yeah, well, the first thing is, and, and, and this sounds obvious, but it's absolutely necessary. And you know, many of these institutions have balance sheets over a trillion uh, dollars in size. Um, so the first is to know your emissions, know your financed emissions, um, and uh, including uh, as much as possible and certainly where material uh, a good estimate of uh, the scope three emissions that uh, that portfolio companies have, so you have a sense of it in the in the round. That's that's obvious. That's table stakes. You have to do that in order to manage them properly. The second is to be in a position and be very clear. I mean, you should have your have formulated uh, not just your objectives that that come from being members of the alliance and members of uh, alliances and members of GFANS, but your interim targets that are consistent, for example, with that 2030 objective, because we all know that it's those interim milestones that really drive uh, action. So what are you trying to do, certainly over the next five years, but you know, even interim into that, how are you measuring it, the metrics, et cetera. Um, thirdly, um, the proportion of your assets today that are what I would call, and look, we haven't finalized the terminology here, but are transition assets, which means they are in climate solutions, so they're you know they're they're part of enabling uh, net zero. Uh, they're fully aligned. Second bucket, they're fully aligned with net zero already. So think you know renewable power, for example, or a business model that is uh, that is fully Paris aligned. Third bucket that they are aligning. So you have a view. You know what the capex plan is. Uh, you have confidence in the management. You know what the sectoral pathway you're using, the reference point, and you have a have a have confidence that there's going to be conversion. So they're aligning. That's the third, and then fourth, uh, a proportion of your assets that actually are going to be wound down or phased out, consistent with Paris. Um, you're in a position two three years from now where you know what percentage of your assets at that point fall into those various buckets, and you have a view of where you think you're going to be two years from now, two years from then, uh, five years from then on your pathway to there. And of course, to get there, you need an engagement strategy. Um, uh, you need uh, you know, you need to be working with the portfolio companies and maybe you're gonna need to make some tough decisions down the road in terms of who you stick with and who you don't. Um, and ideally as well, what we will have at that point is um, the start of a track record uh, because of early reporters um, that shows growth in those proportion of transition assets. Last thing, all of that, what I just said, um, are, uh, you know, can get boiled down into hard numbers in the end. You know, what are the emissions? What are your targets? Where are you on the pathway to the targets? What proportion of your assets are consistent with those targets, et cetera? The one other thing I think we would really want as a product of this process is much sharper, clearer, uh, and more urgent feedback to governments um, uh, and other stakeholders, but particularly governments for the policies that are needed. If there are log jams, if there are holes in the policy framework, uncertainties, uh, and the feedback, you know, what's holding back the transition? What else is needed? Um, and it's based on constant engagement and effort uh, in order to get there. Uh, and that's how we don't just, you know, finance, uh, you know, the, the, that, that's how we broaden the financing pool. And that's how we can really uh, ensure that we get uh, the feedback that, um, and the, and the self-reinforcing process that we need in order to accelerate this. Wonderful, Mark. I think your, um, your trade as a financial regulator shows through in terms of providing <laughs> clear expectations to um, to market actors. And if I could recast this a little bit, um, the steps 
systems in place to be able to measure, essentially monitor finance emissions, setting interim targets. And I should, as an aside, say, this is the structure of the principles of responsible banking as a starting point. Systems yeah. to monitor impact, setting priorities and setting targets to improve um, uh, on set impacts. And then creating the buckets. First, which assets are fully aligned with the transition, which are in the process of aligning and which ones have ultimately are going to be, to be um, uh, wound down. We need to boil this in using frameworks to actually get to uh, hard numbers that are actionable. Um, and then um, finally to create um, a sharper you know, policy feedback, clarity on what exactly is holding back the ability for the whole system to move in the direction we need. So maybe if I could cast that, this is the Carney playbook um, and it, when it comes That's down to it, it's actually, um, it's, it's aligned, it's, it's pragmatic. And I think ultimately we realize that this is the way um, all actors in the economy, including certainly the financial actors uh, need to transition. So uh, Mark with that, maybe if I could send a, a huge thank you uh, for your, your time today, but more importantly, I think for your commitment and your mobilization um, of uh, the finance industry broadly. And we're really pleased with the new NetFI to be supporting uh, the alliances we're working with and more generally to be contributing to GFANS and to the overall um, ambition and the, the, uh, the need to, to deliver and to show how the, the, the financial economy has a role to play in, in, in getting the green, the, the real economy um, to um, stable climate, resilient climate and uh, a strong, just transition. With that, um, uh, Mark, a uh, real pleasure and uh, looking forward to continue to contributing going forward. My pleasure. Thank you, Eric.